have also allowable harm. Will mitigate the harm. I read a quote the other day on uh, natural gas drilling and the whole fracking stuff going on. Um, that uh, I think it was a medical doctor that said that all mitigation means is putting a longer fuse on the time bomb. And that was her view of what mitigation truly means um, around her view of, of the way that we allow these things. In essence, we make them allowable, we permit it, it goes through, in essence, um, because of the way that the system is set up. In essence, for us not to say, no to these things that are obviously, from a community's perspective at least, harmful from a lot of vantage points. Again, not just environmentally, but economically, and socially, and, and all the other things. Um, but how the system itself doesn't put us in a position even to say no, or if you want to flip it, it doesn't even put us in a position to say yes. And we'll get into some more of what that means. You know, even if you want to advocate for something, maybe you're not against something, but you're actually ad want to advocate for something. There's structural things that we run into, including including this structure here around regulations. And the next thing we'll get into is for the other barriers that force us to stay within a certain frame of thinking, and that's with a certain frame of activism, because that's where they want to keep the folks uh, away from the understanding that they have deeper structural issues. So just to give some, some context, this, this stuff doesn't come out of thin air. I mean, it has, there's a rhyme and a reason for why we have uh, a regulatory type system. And in fact, the interesting thing is, um, especially particularly towards this issue of concern communities are having around the coal train. It was actually the, the railroads that actually prompted the first regulatory agency to be put in place in the first place, which a lot of regulatory agencies are modeled after. And this was in the late 1800s when there was the big expansion of railways out west. And in the process of doing so, they were interfering with uh, ranchers and farmers and communities. Um, uh, fences were being destroyed, cattle was being killed. Uh, a lot of things were happening uh, as the railways were, were pushing, and these uh, localities, mainly counties themselves, were looking at trying to hold the railways liable to some level um, based on their activities. And they tried to do so by tax, typically, in essence. Okay, you're going to put your railroad through here, you're going to cause some damage, in essence, there's going to be impact to your activity, we're going to tax you for it. Um, and eventually what came out of it, a lot of different things came out of it, but one of the things that came out of it was the Interstate Commerce Act uh, the late 1800s, which then formed the first regulatory agency was the Interstate Commerce Commission. So it became this commission of which was supposed to regulate the railroads. In essence, it was uh, um, there to supposedly protect the community, the individuals, from railroad activity to make sure things like pricing and other those kinds of things were being, in essence, monitored by this overarching agency. Um, but the interesting thing is, and this uh, quote I'm going to read uh, actually came from the Attorney General a few years after that, that law had passed, and this is a, a comment, um, I'm not exactly sure where it was pulled from, but it was a comment made to the President of the Burlington Northern Railroad um, in referencing what he viewed the Interstate Commerce Commission actually being about. Um, and in some ways it kind of it summarizes a lot of what regulatory agencies are still about today. And again, it has nothing to do with the individuals themselves that are part of the organizations, because uh, I've talked to a number of these people, and, and they do get extremely frustrated, because I think they also have potentially a different view before joining some of these groups about what their role is going to be. And of course, if you're in it long enough, you understand actually how it functions. And um, we'll get into some of the reasons why uh, regulatory agencies are actually hamstrung and confined to what they do, because of other reasons I mean, about how the structure works. But, in this particular quote, this attorney general's name was Richard Olney. He said to the president of Burlington Railroad, this is in 1893, he said, the Interstate Commerce Commission is or can be made of great help to the railroads. It satisfied the popular clamor of the government supervision of the railroads. At the same time, the supervision is almost entirely nominal. Further, the older such a commission gets to be, the more inclined it will be to take the business and railroad side of things. It thus becomes a sort of barrier between the railroad corporations and the people, and sort of a protection against hasty and crude legislation hostile to railroad interests. Uh, so, to, and again, this is a few years back, but it, it in some ways still reflects about how these agencies work, what their intentions were. And again, a lot of the regulatory agencies, at least on the federal level, were modeled after the Interstate Commerce Commission. Um, so, to give you some idea of that we think that there's the Department of Ecology, the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, again, those words sometimes don't mean what you think they might mean. That's not to say that some of the work that they do within those agencies isn't good work, 
but overarchingly, they're caught in the system of which regulations have been written, of which they have to somehow enforce or follow, and that prohibits them, in essence, from doing something bigger than uh, what they're allowed to do. Um, so to kind of get at more of when I say the structure and how it functions, I'm going to do another little diagram here. And again, if we had more time, we would take we would take a lot more time to get to this point. But my whole goal is just to give you some semblance of of why it is that we can't say no or yes on the local level. <coughs> so we have something called a box of allowable. You can say remedies. Another word that we sometimes use in there is even activism, sort of what what you're allowed to do to sort of take the cliche of in the box and out of the box, but um, it's a simple, easy way to sort of try to describe something that's, in some cases, not simple. So one of those, and we have, in essence, a box. And you have multiple things outside the box, and there's more than four things, but you have a lot of things outside this box that are forces that want to push you back inside the box, whether you're an activist group, whether you're a community, whatever it is. Um, you, you're, meant to be, you're meant to be contained. In essence, you're, you're only allowed certain provisions and certain remedies within whatever the box says is allowable. And the interesting thing enough is this box is not static, of course. In some cases, it's actually shrinking. And again, fracking is another great example. Um, we've seen communities who push back on this idea of hydraulic fracturing for, again, all the reasons that we laid out in our triangle. Um, and you've now seen state legislation come forth that actually um, prohibits any sort of local input. And uh, where there's been some local control has been around zoning. So you have zoning laws around setbacks and this and that, that actually revoke those powers even on the local level. <coughs> and actually use language that explicitly says you cannot prohibit this activity from taking place in your community. You have no control. So in essence, that box will shrink. And there's other things that help shrink this box. In essence, help contain us in our activism and what we think is feasible or allowable and doable. And, what we were talking about mainly through the state uh, regulatory stuff is, is really state preemption. So in essence, you have state regulatory agencies at the state level that may be linked to something at the federal level that in essence regulates the kind of industry. Um, again, think about anything for the most part. Um, it's probably being regulated somehow by a state agency. So in essence, you have state preemption. So what that means is the state preempts you, meaning you the municipality or you the county. So in essence, there's powers that are in the state that not, then they're not within the municipal or county government. And if they are, they've in essence usually been defined and designated by the state itself. Now there have been challenges to say that, well, if you didn't break, you know, if you didn't define it, then we're going to take a hold of that and actually use that to push against it. In most of those cases, if there's been a challenge of that nature, the ruling usually comes down on behalf of the state, not on you at the municipal or the county level. So in essence, we have a very, uh, overarching, we have a very preemptive type governmental structure as it stands. We have the federal government, state government, and local government. And so if you state regulations, you see the state preempting you at the local. In essence, those regulations are written at the state level, and they actually define how a practice is going to take place. Not you and your community, even though you're the one that's going to be impacted by it. You don't actually write the rules um, from the state perspective. We don't really have a coal problem or a factory farm problem or a sewage sludge problem. We have a democracy problem because if uh, decisions are made by fewer and fewer people these days, mostly in the corporate form, who's deciding for us at the community level? So the question is, are we okay with that? Or do we actually want decision-making power over the health, safety, welfare, growth, sustainability, whatever word you want to throw in there, what our communities look like? And then if that's the case, how do we actually go about restructuring that? based upon how the structure operates. So we'll get into that investment building, one can say over hundreds of years, um, based on how uh, our constitution structure, where our constitution comes from, how things like corporate constitutional rights evolved, how things like the regulatory bodies come into play, how we put commerce and property over really the health, safety, and welfare of us and our natural environment. There's, there's all kind of factors that go into it that aren't only just about where we live, but we also have now pushed things out to such a global level around climate change, you know, it's, it's a big issue that we're dealing with here. And so the work that we'll, we do, we'll walk through how the ordinances are structured, is really is the first steps about what could be possible. Um, but understanding in some ways that we have to take action on where we live. And in some ways, um, we're only left with the possibility of doing things where we live because things are pretty insulated. 
at the state legislative level, level at the federal level, at the international level. So the question is, how do you build a movement that's strong enough to bring down that structure and put something else in place? And that's that's the big unknown at the moment. So state preemption is one of these forces that will drive in the box. Another thing that we hear about a lot um, lately, and different groups are mobilized against this notion of corporate rights. So most recently, of course, the whole idea of um, the Supreme Court decision about unlimited spending in uh, political arena by anybody, <coughs> most specifically corporations, um, is about First Amendment rights, of course, in the Constitution, statewide as well as federally, we have a Bill of Rights. Um, and corporations basically have the same rights that you and I do. They have Bill of Rights protections. That's not just the First Amendment, uh, but they have Fourth Amendment right protections, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment right protections. And how these come into play is that if you, on a state level or you, on a local level, put something in place that violates those rights, guess what the lawsuit has included within it's the fact that you violated our rights? Me, you meaning me, the corporation. So. Uh, uh, one of the things they could sue on is that you violated the 14th Amendment, uh, my 14th Amendment rights, equal protection under the law. Because what you could say is, we think farming looks like this, and now you're saying you're not allowed this kind of farming in, in essence, you violated our 14th Amendment rights. Because corporations have those rights under the Constitution. Which is another thing when I say the arrow is going in, it's another thing that keeps us inside the box, because we don't invariably want to step out, because you're going to step right into something like corporate constitutional rights. And also, you're most likely going to step into something called state preemption uh, as well. Um, sort of tied to that, but sometimes we put it um, separate, which is another thing that's a hot issue right now, uh, are things like the Commerce Clause. In the US Constitution, you have something called the Commerce Clause, which basically says that it's Congress's power to regulate all commerce. So in essence, <coughs> the power is solely in that of Congress, not you as a community, not you at the state level, not you at the county level. That's Congress's purview, that's Congress's arena in essence. And so how that actually translates to, for instance, the corporate interest um, is they will use the Commerce Clause as a way to make sure that there isn't laws being put in place that create a barrier for them to do their business. In. An example, um, in the state of Virginia, who was starting to get a lot of out-of-state waste, so waste management corporation, uh, was bringing in out-of-state waste and dumping it in landfills in Virginia. And they were starting to realize that they were running out of landfill space, and they had their own trash to figure out how to get rid of the problem in itself. But, so they basically said, well, we can't really in the long term allow out-of-state waste to come in and manage our own waste, so we're going to put a law in place that actually helped, um, makes prohibits out-of-state waste from coming into Virginia landfills. Well, lo and behold, Waste Management Corporation says, you know, hold on a second, you can't do that because by doing so, you're violating the Commerce Clause in the U.S. Constitution because you're, a, you're the state, you're not the federal Congress, you can't make laws interfering with commerce. Interstate commerce. Interstate, well, it even goes deeper than that. But um, meaning that waste, in essence, can be defined as commerce. And now you, the state, have said, we're not going to allow this kind of commerce, but we're going to allow, in essence, this kind of commerce. You've now violated the Commerce Clause. So it's another thing that keeps us, in essence, inside the box, is if you step out of that and actually want to define, in essence, what you think is a more viable commerce, let's say, in your own community, you're more than likely going to run into the Commerce Clause if someone thinks otherwise. Usually the someone is the corporate interest that's going to challenge you on the notion that you have the ability to put a law like that in place. Another thing of which affects us here at the local level is something called Dillon's Rule. Has anybody heard of Dillon's Rule? So, have you? Yeah, I'm, I'm from Virginia. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so Dillon's Rule um, is basically this legal, it's a legal doctrine, it's not legislation, but it's basically been adopted by almost all the states as in essence being law. So this is another way in which law is made that, in essence, is another force against us at the local level. The way you think of Dillon's rule is that <coughs> Dillon's rule is talking about the relationship between the state and the municipal government or the county government. And the way that to think about Dillon's rule is that the state government is the parent and the local government is the child. <coughs> the child is only allowed to do what the parent says it can do. 
So in essence, all the power that gets down to the municipal level is granted by this, is in essence granted or chartered by the state. And so powers can be given, but powers can be unilaterally taken away. So in essence, you have no choice what things may look like on the local level because the state actually over, overrules you, or in essence, with Dylan's rule, it supersedes you. And we saw that come into play uh, two summers ago, I think it was, in Michigan. There was some financial issues going on. <coughs> the state government said that there's some mismanagement of finances happening at the local level. And they actually went in there and actually pushed aside the whole city governmental operations and actually appointed a private administrator to administrate the affairs of the community. <laughs> so um, to show you how Dillon's rule works, that's an example of how Dillon's rule works because the state can do so. It can take powers away and it can grant powers. In that case, it took powers away for the own government to run its affairs and actually put a state administrator in place um, to do so. And in fact, Dillon went so far as to say that there's really no reason even to elect local officials because all that the local all, all the local government is is an administrative arm of the state. So when we look at what's, all, what's that? All the it's an administrative arm of the state. There's no reason, in his view, John Dillon, the guy that wrote this document, there's even no reason to elect your local officials. Because all the municipal government is is an extension of the state. And and again, when we when we're dealing with issues like factory farms or whatever it is that may come up that we don't want, this is another thing that you're going to run into this idea of Dillon's rule. Um, another thing just to throw it out there, as it stands today, under law, nature is property. So we have a property view of nature. Nature has no rights. Um, it's seen strictly as property. And in most cases, um, really what it comes down to is you can do pretty much what you want if you own the property. And that's how we have private property rights and the power of how that private property rights comes into play. <coughs> surprise, surprise, who owns the most land besides government? Well, it's corporations. So in essence, they're allowed to do what they want because we view nature as it stands as property. So even environmental laws are all pinned to this idea of property. In fact, most of the environmental laws that were passed on the federal level, they only exist within our structure of law and government because they're related to the Commerce Clause. So to, to show the power that commerce is, even your environmental laws are associated with um, with commerce, um, environmental laws are associated with commerce. Even the civil rights laws that were passed in the 60s, the only reason they exist is they're actually related to commerce. Because when the, when the civil rights amendments were passed, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, there were laws actually passed by the federal government to actually make those amendments real, which was about not allowing uh, inns or restaurants or theaters to deny African Americans the right to access those services. Um, the cases that came out of it eventually said, well, government can actually can't do that because the, those are private businesses, they're not government. So in essence, it made those constitutional amendments pretty much null and void. They have no power. And so when the civil rights movement sort of flared up again, not that it actually really went away, but when it kind of came to the head in the 60s, the reason why we were able to put in those laws, the Civil Rights Act of the 60s, is because they managed to find a place for it, and the place that they hung it on was Congress. In essence, saying, well, you can't deny an African American right of passage on a bus because you're affecting commerce. <coughs> and so, even even the good stuff that we try to do to protect the environment or civil rights, a lot of it still is all geared towards the idea of, of in essence, protecting commerce first and foremost. And if it happens to protect civil rights, then it happens to protect civil rights. And again, not to make light of the civil rights effort and what went down, especially with yesterday being the anniversary of, of King's assassination, but. Just to show you structurally again how things operate, um, this is again coming out of constitutional structure. Um, there's other things that also on um, the outside area that we won't get into, but basically to say is besides that regulatory system, which is again how a lot of our activism and our, our focus goes to, which is related to state preemption, these are some of the other things that keep us in essence inside the box. In essence, telling you don't step outside the box, because if you do, you're going to get hammered by one in most cases, all of these things. I mean, there's lawsuits uh, through communities that we work with that basically name all this stuff. When they do, the, and the corporate interests, when they, when they sue a community, they don't leave anything out. <laughs> because if something else gets struck, they can grab onto something else in the process. So they're, they're not shy about when they sue a community to make sure that they, shoot, they, that they sue on all these grounds. Okay. It's about proving the environmental damage of which then has damaged you. It's never about 
the ecosystems for the ecosystem right, sake, right. and all the other things that rely on the fact that it needs something to help well, you water obviously it's very anthropocentric. Yeah. yeah, so that's, in essence, when we say nature is, uh, has no right to nature's property, it's within that frame. Mm -hmm. Even though, I guess, when we, maybe when we think about it, we want to think about it differently, but how the law treats it. And, and again, we're not the only country, but every country treats nature in that same manner. Mm -hmm. In some ways, people say that's part of why we have the environmental conditions we do is because we have, in essence, elevated the environment to the point of being protected from a rights-based standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's why the, that nature as property piece is another thing that, that kind of keeps us in the condition we're at. We have to step out of the structure as it stands and challenge, in some ways, the structure and the law. But say, like, that pyramid was turned upside down. I mean, that's technically not dismantling the system, but it's um, well, in some ways, that's kind of what the proposal is by actually taking the structure on. It is about flipping the triangle. That's a good way to look at it. But when you flip that triangle, that that is the, the same. That's the same thing as stepping outside the box because you're not allowed to flip the triangle because the triangle has been built a certain way to operate a certain way. And when you want to flip the triangle, you run into all these forces in this box that allow the remedies that are going to jam you back into that box because you don't have the authority to flip the triangle. So it's a, it's a hard issue sometimes to wrap our heads around because, again, it gets so much bigger than maybe the initial threat of which has rallied us, whether it's coal trains or something else, because we have a deeper structural problem that has to be addressed um, if we're truly about changing the structure for the various reasons that communities have come to the conclusion that we need to. Um, so that kind of runs into sort of what communities are doing. And so, again, this is all being fired at you pretty fast. We usually let people in the workshops have a little more time to get to this, but even then, it's sometimes a little bit overwhelming. Um, but I just wanted to give folks at least a quick snapshot of, of what it what it really looks like, and you know, especially when it's dealing with some serious issues in our community, whether it's food, whether it's energy, whether it's development, I and mean, all that stuff runs into that that regulatory triangle for the most part. And it's going to run into all these these forces that are going to want to keep us in the box for the most part as well. All operates pretty much the same. And so, as I was saying, com communities, um, we as an organization, and communities have decided actually we have to start doing something differently. And so, um, we started writing in essence new law on behalf of these communities. So the communities looked at us and said, "Well, we need new law, and you need to help us with this." Um, so the very first uh, sort of evolution of these laws took place in 2002. 2003, um, and they were mainly focused at, um, at really the, the, the corporate rights piece. Um, over time, we began to add in all the other elements, but they really were kind of focused on this idea of corporate rights. And so you had small townships that were passing, in essence, were anti-corporate farming laws that said, well, we're going to validate um, you know, family farm corporations, but not big agriculture coming in to dictate what farming is going to look like. We're going to actually exclude those, and to exclude those, we have to invalidate this idea of corporate constitutional rights of which they're going to try to wield against us. And so you have two townships that actually passed these laws. They were the first ones to actually pass the really binding law to say corporations aren't, don't, aren't to be seen as people under the law. So they were the first ones to actually pass local law to take on that notion that corporations are persons. Uh, over time, like I said, uh, as we start to learn more, that also worked its way into democracy schools, but within the laws themselves, the laws actually evolved to actually take on all these other elements. And so what you see today is really um, the, the accumulation of that of that work uh, with communities to get the laws into that position. <coughs> Before I kind of <coughs> talk about that, excuse me, just to give you some idea of what when I say you get hammered when you step outside the box. Eventually, um, a number of these communities passed uh, similar laws to those first two communities, but slightly different. <clears throat> and enough of them passed it, there were 80 or 100 communities that passed these laws in Pennsylvania to say no to corporate farming or no to corporate sludging in their communities, um, that the reaction um, wasn't uh, solely about litigation. So in essence, the corporation coming in and suing the community saying, you can't do this, sorry, for all these reasons, you know, thanks for playing. Um, but they actually went to, they took legislative action. So in essence, the corporations, the big ag industry in Pennsylvania, went to the state legislature, and they drove in a, a whole new law. So they were responsible for driving in that Nutrient Management Act thing to make it easier for them to do their factory farms in the first place. And then when, when towns still were pushing back against this notion of factory farming, 
they went back to the state again to pass a new law. Uh, and that new law uh, did a couple of, uh, did actually uh, a, a new thing that hadn't really been done before because previous to that, it was about the corporation coming to you and your community and suing you. So it was about private enforceability of the law, which is how most law tends to work. So the corporation had to spend time and money. Now, I say have to spend time and money. The reality is corporations use uh, their, their legal expenses as a, as a, as a, as a normal operation as tax deductible. So uh, and for a while, we thought we were costing corporations money, but then we found out that that's actually all tax deductible. So the beauty of this new law, I'm going to say beauty again from their perspective, because okay, they're always thinking and looking at how to do things easier for themselves. And they're kind of like water, they go where the least resistance is, and they go to the state. And they passed this new law, and the, the basic premise of the new law was to, in essence, make it illegal for, for towns to pass anti-corporate farming laws. So they were explicit about saying you cannot pass anti-corporate farming laws. And not only can't you pass that, but we are now going to put the state attorney general in a position to sue your municipality if you do so. Okay? So it's a radical shift, because it was no longer about the corporation having to come and sue you. Now your own state government is going to come and sue you, because you put a law in place that they say, that they say is illegal. So in essence, the attorney general can come into your town and say, well, you have a law that actually is in violation of state law, and we're going to sue you. So it's, it's not the corporation anymore, but it's the state itself. And the reason why that's important is to show, in essence, how the broader structure works. That it's not just the corporation, but how the corporation uses something like the state government, in essence, as another corporate right. There's another way you can expand out that notion of corporate rights. So it's not just geared towards civil rights protections, but it ends up being a right of the corporation when they pass such things at the state level. Um, and so the state, in a couple of cases, came in and sued municipalities for having these laws. Um, from our end, um, it ends up doing something of which we can never do on our own. That's what we try to describe this to communities or people. Um, sometimes they don't see it. And sometimes you have to actually get hit over the head with it before you, you understand what, what things are really about, how they really function. In some ways, that, that law actually ended up being a good thing. It ended up being kind of an organizing tool. Because one of the things that came out of it is when the state came in and actually sued one of these townships in Pennsylvania, in the legal brief that was prepared by the Attorney General's office, um, that Attorney General is now the governor of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, he, in the uh, very, I think it was the first paragraph, I got it in front of me, he basically said, there is no inalienable right to local self-government. So you had the state of Pennsylvania telling people in the local townships, you know, again, even if you want to protect your health, safety, and welfare, well, you can't, because there is no inalienable right to local self-government. So it was your own top legal official saying you can't do this because you have no right to do it. And so people can either say, okay, thanks, and then go away, or they could use that to say, well, wait a second, I thought all political power was inherent in the people. Why don't we have the rights to protect our community and say that we want this kind of farming versus that kind of farming? So those communities use it as, as, as an, uh, an organizing tool to get other communities to pass similar laws. So in essence, they're being defined under the current structure, much like, again, the abolitionists said, we can't find remedy under the current structure. And so if we're going to change it, we can't actually justify it by living under it, but we have to actually establish something new. <clears throat> and again, so what's come out of that is this evolution of, of lawmaking that we've helped communities with that have, again, gone to other issues, whether it's corporate water uh, withdrawal, whether it's uh, fracking, whether it's the factory farm stuff. And actually, we've begun to write new law that actually puts rights at the center. So this idea of community rights at the center. In the process, it may ban a certain corporate activity from taking place, and then it nullifies all those forces that want to jam you inside the box. And so another way to look at these local laws, knowing that they're being defiant to the system, is in essence being disobedient to what the system says is allowable, um, another way we try to frame it is by doing these things on the local level, you're blueprinting what may be possible at, at higher levels or on more expanded levels. It gives, in essence, a blueprint of what could be uh, taking place um, at the state level or at the federal level. Because uh, to kind of move into where this stuff is going to go, it's going to take thousands of communities to do something similar on the local level to actually have enough force to crack things at the state level, to eventually have things to crack at the federal level. So this is ultimately where this stuff is moving to. And whatever brings the community together around the issues, whether it's coal trains or something else, it's the understanding that the structure operates in a certain manner. And so you're taking on, in essence, the structure itself, 
is to show others what the structure looks like, to begin to sort of envision what it would look like to crack things to a different level, to recognize the environment differently, to recognize local self-government differently, to recognize who actually has decision-making power in the place where you live. 